Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for CASA's webinar presentation, Five High Liability Issues in the Management of Public Schools. In the management of a school or district, school safety issues create problems with liability funding and education goals. Today's webinar, uh, today's webinar will cover the following topics that include lack of accurate understanding of safety issues, planning without assessment, guessing is not planning, reaction, not prediction, poor management of schools, the real issue in school safety, lack of effective plans to combat truancy and lateness, truancy is the root of all school safety issues, and lastly, poor emergency management, don't ask amateurs without training to do what professionals do. Our, this is a little bit about our presenters today, some of their biographical background. Mr. Dale Yeager began his education as a criminal analyst in 1988. He has extensive training in criminal psychology, forensic psychology, sex crimes investigation, and crime scene forensics procedures, and domestic terrorism analysis, including advanced training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. In 2000, Congress tasked Dale and his expert team at SERAF to produce a State of School Safety in America report. SERAF has provided three reports to date. Dale's research work on school violence has been published in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin and the Texas Attorney General's Report on School Violence. In 2005, Dale was appointed to the Development Committee for the Fairleigh Dickinson University School Security and Safety Administration Master's Program. Dale and his team have provided school safety training to over 26,000 schools in the U.S. Mr. Andy Demidon brings to us uh, his experience as, as retired from the public education system after more than 35 years of service. During his tenure in public education, Andy served as assistant principal, high school principal, and superintendent. Andy has been nominated to serve on a statewide task force on restructuring education in Pennsylvania and has been the recipient of numerous state and national service awards. Following our presentation, we will have a, a Q&A or question and answer session, so please everyone feel free to, if you have any questions, submit them to the presenter by using our chat feature, which is located at the right side of your screen. Um, and we encourage all of our attendees to submit any questions that you might have, and Andy and, and Dale will do their very best to answer your questions. At this point, we will turn the presentation over to Andy and Dale, and it is now your presentation, Dale. Thank, thank you, Carol. Uh, this is Dale Yeager. Uh, uh, we're having a problem with Andy's uh, telephone connection, so I'm going to do the best I can to move through this and hopefully Andy will be able to uh, to secure his uh, his line. They're having problems with the storm where he's located. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone, and today we're going to talk about the liability issues in schools that generally are not discussed. And these are critical whether you are an attorney or a law firm that represents schools, or if you're an attorney or a law firm that has an action pending against the school system. And so we're going to be talking to both sides uh, so that all of you understand these issues from our expertise of over 20 years. First, let's talk about some facts. And one of the things that we do is make sure we source everything. So this information, you can readily uh, grab this online from the Juvenile Justice Bulletin and also from the U.S. Department of Justice, which is usdoj.gov. And one of the things that we find that uh, as we train school administrators across the United States and even in Canada, they really have very little understanding of, in many cases, what's really going on as far as crime trends are concerned or, or, uh, or, or any kind of aggression in general. And this is critically, critically important. So first of all, 2.7 million crimes are committed at schools every year in America. Now of this 2.7 million crimes, 73% are suburban and rural schools. One of the things that uh, Andy and I and the team have found in, in working in schools is that suburban schools tend to be um, 
somewhat arrogant. Uh, there's no other better word for it, but they tend to be arrogant about their ability to have uh, to to be in control of their schools, and yet most of them have never had any type of assessment done, which we'll talk about later. And they really, when we when we finally talk to them and and start digging in a little bit, they really don't have a clear idea of what's going on in their school systems. They assume an awful lot. And one of the one of the things that backs this up is the federal uh, facts that crimes are being committed primarily in suburban and rural schools. And so the first thing I want you to do is think about school safety as an everybody problem, not just a city or urban problem. Next, students ages 12 through 18 more, more, more likely to be victims of non-fatal violent crimes such as rape, sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault. Total number of crimes committed in schools against this age group is 253,000. Of that number, 60% are suburban and rural schools. Again, not an urban problem, not a city problem. It's an everybody problem. Uh, lastly, teachers. Now, before I read this statistic, uh, according to the Justice Department, in this, this name, teachers, for, for research purposes, they include teachers, teachers' aides, uh, school counselors, as well as principals. So it's a generalized term that they're using for the research. Teachers are the victims of over 400,000 violent crimes each year, and that's rising. Those crimes are committed in, as, uh, in groups as young as five or six in kindergarten, first grade, and also in high school. So it's, it's across the board in age, not just in the, in the high school or the middle school um, areas of the school. Most sexual assault, according to the U.S. Justice Department and the Department of Education, in schools is happening for the last 10 years in special education classrooms. And we're going to talk about classroom management here uh, in, 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 a, in a short while. And so knowing the facts, getting the information, and seeing the trends is critically important uh, to understand this liability issue. Types of school violence. Uh, I want you today to stop thinking just about the school shooter or just about bullying. There's a lot going on in a school environment from K to 12. Student to tu student, student to teacher, teacher to student, teacher to staff, staff to student, vendor to student, visitor to student, visitor to teacher. There are so many areas that have to be secured. So many policies that are lacking and, and, and management systems that are lacking in schools. And one of the key areas is F, which is vendor to student. According to the U.S. Justice Department, 30%, around 30% of all assaults on students are by vendors. So that's the Coke man, the milk lady, the person who comes in to sell insurance. Anyone who is not a, a, a staff member or a student in a school is a stranger from a security perspective, and they must be monitored, not with cameras, but with eyes, physical, physically with a human eye. Here's the problem. Too much equipment makes people lazy. People think that the camera is going to solve all their problems. Well, all of you know that there isn't a camera in, in the world that has cognitive function or peripheral vision. Only human beings have that. And so cameras are really just a backup to good management. And one of the things that our, our motto as, as, a, as a group has always been a well-managed school is a safe school. We find that almost every school security or safety issue comes down to simple, simply poor management, poor training of, of the management teams, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's the principals, or, or even higher up among the administrators and superintendents. But this issue of vendors, most of, most of you have been in schools where the vendors are roaming around with a visitor's pass on. Well, that doesn't prevent them from touching a student or assaulting a student or doing any of that. And, and again, they must be monitored when, when they're in the facility, and this is not being done. Some people will say, well, they just don't have the personnel to do it. And that's just not true. We, we set up systems all the time in schools to make sure that vendors are monitored, visitors are monitored, and it doesn't disrupt the everyday uh, work of the principals or the teachers or the staff. It can be done with existing personnel and it does not disrupt their day. Uh, there's a lot of myth out there and in, in general sometimes a lot of, uh, a lot of laziness on the part of adults who should know better. Number one, lack of accurate understanding of safety issues. First and foremost, you must assess what's going on in your school system. 
Well, assessing what's going on in your school system means that you're going to have to do a climate assessment and you're going to have to do some type of an audit of security and safety. Well, first uh, and foremost, it's important to understand that right now in this climate, all schools are looking for money. They're looking for grants. They're looking for, for additional funding on a state and federal level. One of the things that Andy and I uh, do on a, a regular basis every six to eight weeks is we contact the, our contacts in the Department of Education in Washington. And we keep in contact with them primarily to look at funding opportunities for our clients. One of the things that became very clear about a year and a half ago was that the Department of Ed was not going to give out money anymore to schools that had not done climate assessment. And simply put, a climate assessment is an assessment of classroom management, uh, how well it's being performed, because poor classroom management is really one of the key elements in bullying. And I'm not saying that. The Department of Ed, it, it, their own research for 10 years has shown that. Um, classroom management, the management by the principals, the management in each department, that's a climate assessment. On top of that, a security and safety audit has to be performed, and that starts with the neighborhood. That starts by talking to law enforcement, juvenile probation, social services. What are the trends that are happening in that school system? What are, what are the trends in crime and youth violence and youth aggression, cliques and gangs and, and, and family structure that is affecting the students or feeding into that uh, school system or that school or that, that charter school or tech school? And so, so to do this requires professionals who first and foremost have to understand how a school operates. Most of the security audits that your clients uh, as school systems have had performed are lacking. They don't even meet basic um, Depart U.S. Department of Education standards for a security audit. Police officers, who we love uh, at, at our company, we do a lot of law enforcement training, uh, do not understand how schools operate. They do not understand No Child Left Behind. They don't understand how classrooms are managed because they're not educators. And so it's critically important that someone who has had experience managing schools perform those audits so they understand what, should, what they should be looking at. They, they understand what they're looking at. They understand how it should look and how it should be performing from a management perspective and from a policy perspective. Most schools have never done this type of assessment. But that brings us to special education. Special education is the biggest cost now uh, in most school systems because special needs children are growing at a, a, an alarming rate uh, each year, every year. It is now estimated by the U.S. Department of Education as of two years ago that over the next five years, 70% of all students K-12 will be special needs. And so it's critically important that schools uh, change the way they're doing things and start asking some critical questions of their special education departments. First of all, number one is, does your uh, special education director, whoever is directing and overseeing all special education in your school system, actually have proper training in understanding federal and state law, especially federal law, related to, to special needs? I will tell you that sadly, and we have a pretty good sample to work from, uh, in, in our team's expert, uh, experiences that they don't. They have very poor training. They, they lack a basic knowledge, uh, you know, forget a detailed knowledge, but a basic knowledge of federal law as it relates to ADA and uh, U.S. Department of Education law. And this creates liability. And this is why many school systems are losing uh, losing uh, lawsuits in special education because they are not set up correctly. Their policies are not in keeping with federal regulations. And then on a side note, it's one of the reasons why most school systems are not getting federal grants uh, for special education because they have not done an assessment of their special education department. For those of you who are attorneys who have uh, lawsuits pending or you're contemplating uh, legal action against the school system, for special education for a special needs child, this is critically uh, important to understand. Uh, don't assume that they know, because in many cases they don't. Number two is, is that it's important to understand what's going on in every level of a school system. And this is part of the problem also. You don't just do a security audit of your classrooms and of your principals and of your policies. Policies are just words on paper. I can, I can take any policy manual 
from any school system and lay it on a desk and stare at it all day and it will not move. What's more important is assessing how those policies are enacted on a daily basis. And that requires competent people, professional people, hands-on watching how that's done, looking at the effect that that's having. It's not just a statistical thing. It's, it's a management issue. And so understanding what the issues are, the safety and security issues, really requires a complex uh, process to understand that at all levels. And again, our experience says that every school system in America has a very limited idea of what's happening, mainly because they aren't doing the proper assessment or they're scared to. I remember at one point I was in Florida and a, a woman who was the president of a school board of a fairly uh, well-off, uh, the upper middle class school system came up to me and said, we are not going to agree to this audit. And I said, okay. And I said, why? And she said, I have enough problems. I don't need you digging up any more. And we've heard this kind of attitude constantly where people just close their eyes and, and don't deal with the problem. Well, if you, if you don't deal with the problem, eventually students and staff are going to get hurt or killed. And from the other side, you're going to lose your lawsuits. And so this is, this is the critical issue, is asking that question if you have schools that are clients or if you're an attorney uh, in, in currently in a, uh, a lawsuit or, pen, or, or contemplating a lawsuit against the school system, well, what process did you use to assess your issues? That's the starting point of all of this. Number two, reaction, not prediction. It amazes me how many school system uh, administrators will talk to my team and say, uh, as, as superintendents, uh, why does the local press just trash us constantly? And, of course, our response is, when's the last time you had weekly uh, news conferences to tell the community what you're doing and all the positive things you're doing? And, of course, the answer usually is never. Again, if you're not going to prevent something from happening, then it's more than likely going to happen. And this reaction, not prediction, is a critical, critical problem that we're constantly seeing in our school systems across the United States and something that we've explained to Congress, um, you know, each, each of the times that we've gone before Congress to, to talk to them about school safety issues. It's a reaction issue. Every school system, for example, has an emergency plan. Well, an emergency plan is a cleanup list. I don't know about you, but I don't like cleaning. And it, it doesn't prevent anything. It's, it's a reaction to an event that has already occurred. But interestingly enough, most emergencies can be prevented, and certainly injuries from these emergencies can be prevented, but that requires proper policy, proper management, and proper training of key personnel. And so this issue of reaction, not prediction, is a problem. Most of the lawsuits that come across our desk uh, from TASA involving special education, special needs students, are example of this reaction, not prediction. Instead of the directors of special education in a school district uh, thinking about all the problems that, that may occur and planning for that, they basically wing it and then wonder why they've lost the lawsuit. And, and one of the things that, as attorneys, if you have uh, cases uh, against the school system, you need to be asking this question uh, in, your, in your process of building your case is, are they reacting? And what was their method, what's their methodology, what's their process in place for predicting a problem? And if you can't find one, that's, uh, that's the evidence that you're looking for uh, to win your case. Number three, poor management of schools. Poor time management. It amazes me how many times we hear from school systems we have a lot of conflict in the cafeteria. Well, Andy came up with a solution to that many years ago when he was uh, a superintendent in various school systems, basically shorten the lunch period. It, just by cutting off a, a few minutes here and there, it prevents the kids from having nothing to do and end up uh, causing problems. Also shortening the time that they can get from one class to another. Time is not good with kids because they fill it with uh, generally uh, problem uh, behavior. And so this time management issue is a critical issue. And again, from a liability perspective, time management is a critical issue because it, it plays a factor in violence and in crime, uh, the issue of, of how well these students are being managed, and time management is critical. It's something that needs to be looked at, is how, how is time managed within these schools? That policy and how it is, um, 
it's actually uh, performed or used is critically important to look at from both sides, depending no, no matter what you what you do as, as an attorney, whether you're representing schools or you have action against the school. How well do they manage their time? Non-data-based decision. Instead of look, collecting proper data, which again requires proper auditing, uh, and taking that data and saying, what are our trends? Generally, decisions are made uh, by people either uh, by winging it or just uh, guessing at it. A good example of this is something that just really angers me because I, I work on cr criminal cases as a uh, criminal analyst involving juvenile crime, meaning that the juveniles are the perpetrator of the crime. Most of the crimes I work on are sex offense cases. And what I see many times is this idea of just winging and making decisions based on that rather than looking at the trends in, your, in the school. And, and, and this, is, this is frustrating because people get hurt. Kids get hurt when adults are making decisions willy-nilly without a unified team effort. This is a management problem, absolute management problem. But that brings us to the next thing, unwillingness to depart from conventional thinking. Well, this is the way we've always done it. And I'll give you a great example of this. Every state in the United States has some version of a portal-to-portal -portal law. And that means that every school is responsible for every student from their door to the school and back to their door. Now, what's interesting is many schools allow seniors to leave the campus at lunchtime and go into town or, or go off campus. This violates state law in all 50 states, but yet they do it. When asked, why do you allow it? Well, it's a tradition here at the school. Again, whether someone's a, something's a tradition or not doesn't make it legal or even make it uh, make it co uh, common sense. And this is a problem. Just because this is the way we've always done it doesn't mean that it can't be changed. And that conventional thinking creates liability because it's basically saying even in the face of all this data and all these trends that are happening, we are going to still continue down this same path, which hasn't worked, but we're going to continue down that same path. You can make those connections as attorneys uh, why that's a problem. School boards being asked to make decisions without essential data. I always ask school board members, because we have partnerships with several state school board associations, how do you know that the information you're being given by department heads and by your superintendent is accurate? And they always say the same thing. Well, we assume they wouldn't lie to us, really. The problem is, is that school boards are making decisions, and they don't have all the data. They don't have all the facts, and they have no one out there to qualify those facts. Now, I'm certainly not saying that school superintendents and principals all lie. The majority of them are honorable, good, professional people. But there are a group of them that do lie. Uh, you can see this scandal that's brewing down in Washington, D.C., uh, which, which really is uh, people asleep at the wheel and people uh, potentially committing fraud uh, in, that, in that school system. And, again, the, the question is, what did the school board know and when did they know it and how, what's the process? that the school board had to validate information. If you're an attorney who's, 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 who's you know, been contracted to protect the school system, you better be asking those questions of the school board members. If you're an attorney who has an action against a school system uh, or, pen, or, or contemplating it, you need to ask that question. What does the school board know? Many times in school cases, school board members are not deposed. Uh, that's something that we always uh, request. Poor use of technology to handle the mundane tasks. Most of the schools don't even realize that the software they use to record an incident, a bullying incident, a fight, uh, whatever, are seriously lacking. In fact, most of the software programs that exist now in schools, if, if a fight occurs and Tom and Tommy and Bobby start fighting and they push and shove each other and then eventually Tommy kicks Bobby in the face and breaks his nose, the software only allows you to put in one incident, one, one action. So many schools, what they'll do to avoid problems, they'll just put in pushing and shoving. They won't put in the broken nose. A lot of times also is that the technology is uh, not working properly. We go into schools all the time. Uh, we have two audit teams, and one of the things we do is go into the library in the school and try to get on the Internet to all of the pornographic websites. Well, I will tell you that after 22 years, we always get on, 
because the systems are poorly designed and poorly maintained. Technology is not being used in the proper way. One of the things that No Child Left Behind requires is that children be on time to school. You would be surprised how many superintendents and principals don't know this. Most school board members don't know this because we survey them when we talk to them at uh, conferences. There is a lateness clause in No Child Left Behind, and it says, if a child is late 10 minutes or more, four times or more, that counts as one day of absence against the school for funding by the U.S. Department of Education. Well, I will tell you that there are school systems out there that when the first milestone for NCLB occurs are going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in state funding because of the lateness of their students. It's not just an issue of truancy, ch children not coming to school. It's also lateness that's a part of that. Well, the technology that's available to most uh, schools, Andy uh, Demodon has found, can be used to track this issue of lateness and prevent that defunding from happening. Lack of effective ongoing interactive community-wide communications. Again, most schools are horrible at this. They'll subcontract out to some PR firm to do their PR. The PR firm will do the cheaper thing, which is to send out news releases. No one's having news conferences. No, the, the, print, the superintendent's not going on the local radio station or TV station once a month and, and, and taking questions. This interaction is critically important in reducing liability and getting buy-in from the community. Critically important. Number four, lack of effective plans to combat truancy and lateness. We talked a little bit about this before. Again, truancy is the root of all school safety problems. Now, before you dismiss that, let me explain. Truancy is code, it's code for dysfunctional families. And dysfunctional families are producing the bullies, they're producing the negative behavior click leaders, they're, they're producing the gang members, they're producing the trouble both girls and boys, in a school environment. And if you don't get those dysfunctional families into some kind of control, now that control can be soft or it can be punitive, you are going to continue to have this problem of feeding dysfunctional children into the school system, and this dysfunction is going to grow. It grows like a cancer. And so truancy and lateness problems are always interesting to me, especially when you go to suburban schools. Suburban schools will uh, be very proud and talk to my team about, uh, as you know, because all, all my team members are retired school superintendents. And they'll say to my team, oh, we have our truancy numbers, you know, they're less than 1%. And then my team will ask them, well, what about your lateness? And either they won't know or they'll say, oh, well, it's pretty high. And they don't even understand that that's part of federal law and it's affecting their ability to get those federal grants, but more importantly, it's affecting the management, the safe management of their school system on a daily basis because if you're not dealing with truancy, you're really not dealing with your bullying, your negative behavior clicks, and other aggression issues. This is critically important to understand. The first thing that we do when we're, we, we are hired by departments of education to go in and fix troubled school systems, quote, unquote, first thing we do is work on the truancy and get the truancy under control. Ironically, once the truancy is under control, the lateness comes, up, comes under control, and then all of a sudden the bullying numbers go down, the negative behavior click, goes, uh, click numbers go down, everything is affected by truancy and lateness. Very important issue. For emergency management, don't ask untrained people to do what trained people do. Some of you have heard of the dirty 38. The dirty 38 is the 38% of teachers who abandoned their students at Columbine and ran out of the building. 38%. There are recordings of 911 calls where the students are begging for the teachers to come back. Don't run away. Don't run away. And teachers ran out of the building. And the problem is, is that you can't ask people who are amateurs to do what professionals do. Police officers and firefighters do something that is biologically abnormal. They run into danger. Biologically, we run away from danger, whether it's gunfire or fire. But training allows you to go into danger and handle it and manage it correctly. One of our biggest issues is tabletop exercises, which is a critical issue in liability. There is no one who's listening to this phone call who has been in an emergency, and, 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 and once you've been in an emergency, whether it's a car accident or, or a, a surprise illness or something, 
where you had a half an hour or an hour to make a decision. In an emergency, you have to make decisions literally within minutes. When we run tabletop exercises, we run them for two minutes and three minutes with a clock. You never saw people sweat like that before in your life. But if you don't take them psychologically into the stress of an emergency, these safety teams, which every school is required to have by, by uh, the U.S. Department of Justice standards, are not going to be able to perform. You have got to teach them what it's like to be in the middle of an emergency and, and psychologically take them there, because otherwise they're not going to be able to function correctly. As part of our work with the uh, U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, we did a survey of, of suburban, rural, and urban schools in northern New Jersey, southern Connecticut, and the suburbs outside of New York City, the Oranges, in New York. We found that on 9-11, 60% of the adult staff left school, schools without permission. Number one reason I'm going to get my kids. You have to deal with these issues because one of the things that we tell schools is that if your emergency plan cannot be uh, managed with only 40% of your adult staff, you need to redesign it. That brings me to another issue. Most special needs student or special needs teachers have never been trained in emergency management. Now, what do I mean by that? A child who has various spectrum of autism or ADHD, or any other uh, condition, is going to have serious issues with the noise of an emergency. The bells ringing, the siren, the noise. They're going to basically get into an embryo position and not move. I don't know how many of you have children, but when my children were little and they weighed 30 or 40 pounds, if they didn't want to move off the floor, lifting them felt like 200 pounds. And if you don't talk to their unconscious mind, if you're not trained to do that, these kids are not going to get up and come with you, and it's going to be a major catastrophe. Most administrators are assuming, and wrongly, that their special education teachers are trained in the special emergency management of special needs students, and I will tell you that it's just not true. And so this is a critical issue. Your staff needs to be trained. A special education has to have special training for this. And if you're an attorney that is involved in a lawsuit, or contemplating a lawsuit, this is a critical area to look at, is the emergency management training. And what was it, what was done? Were they allowed to sit around for 30 minutes or an hour, drink coffee, tell jokes to each other, or were they put into stress situation and actually properly trained? Critical, critical issue. So, um, in conclusion, before I, I take uh, questions, and I'm going to do my best to answer your questions. I'm sorry, Andy is still having uh, phone issues. Um, what I'd like to say in conclusion is, is that, again, uh, after all of the years of our work, we have found that uh, school safety is a management issue. A well-managed school is a safe school. And when you're looking at your own school system that you're trying to protect from liability, look at the quality of management training and the quality of management on a daily basis. If you're an attorney who is representing a client uh, uh, and, and you are going after a school system or a school Again, look at the management. The, the key to the universe is in understanding the quality of the management training and the management uh, on a daily basis of those schools and those school systems. So I guess I'll turn it over now to, uh, to Carol, and uh, we'll take questions, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Thank you very much, Dale. And, and again, I, I am also sorry that Andy wasn't um, able to join us, but we will we'll continue on. I do have a few questions, um, so I will pose them to you, Dale. The first question is, how does the federal law, ADA, affect school liability? Well, this is, again, after this is over, let me, let me say this. After the, the webinar is over, I will make sure that Andy is available to answer these questions in more detail because he's our school law go-to person, but I'll do my best. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. With ADA, um, ADA is tied uh, to NCLB in several areas, and one of the one of the issues is is that under ADA there has been changes that have recently occurred, and under those new changes, uh, which which will probably be rolled back at some point, with the new changes in ADA, uh, basically 80 percent, and this is the number that was given, 80 percent of all Americans qualify as having a disability. ADA protects not just adults but also children. 
and there are provisions in ADA that tie directly into NCLB. And again, uh, anybody who has a specific question about school law, Andy's the man, and again, I'm sorry about the technical issues, he will be available by phone or email to talk to you and give you specifics about that. Um, and uh, the thing is, is that uh, with with ADA's new change, with their they've, they've just revised it again. This now affects many lawsuits because it has to be considered. One of the things that we find attorneys doing, and something that we recommend, because we do represent both sides as experts, we represent schools. We also represent attorneys who have actions against schools. We recommend that uh, most of these cases, the severe cases, be federal cases. Uh, federally because uh, federal civil rights cases get the attention of the Justice Department. Now, the Justice Department has to enforce ADA and all of its provisions, and one of the things two years ago that the Justice Department decided to do, and they actually had a national news conference about this, is they sent investigators out who are still out there in the United States uh, to investigate the uh, violation of civil rights of students. Most of the, the violations were sexual assaults uh, in special education areas. And so one of the things that they are using to prosecute principals and superintendents and teachers and the like is ADA, uh, and, and they're using that along with criminal code uh, to, to hit it kind of a one-two punch. But again, uh, Andy can talk to you in more detail about that. It's something that we offer as experts through PASA, the ability to tear apart what laws are relevant either in, in defending a case or, or, or a case against the school. So um, he, he would be able to tell you in more detail the, the, the issues there. Thank you, Dale. Um, I have a question here from Stephen, and he asks, one commentator has suggested that it is negligence per se to not have an adequate and sufficient anti-bullying training in the school districts and he has in parentheses, and lack of funding is not an excuse because of the ready availability of free training and program materials all over the country. What say you? Well, I, I would say that um, under uh, all 50 states have some uh, provision in their state educational law or regulations re regarding the training, uh, training on bullying or school violence. And when we say about bullying, you can't isolate this issue. You, you have to include it as part of an overall training about school violence prevention within schools, K-12. to So I would agree that it is outrageous and certainly opens up a school to liability to not have that training. Where I will disagree is that there is not a lot of quality training out there on the specific issue of bullying or school safety. And let, let me explain. Um, much of the information that's out there is, is bad science. It is not... Uh, you can't even find APA formatting of scientific research to back up the statements that are being made. There's a lot of myth out there uh, that's being uh, being told to school administrators as well as adults about about uh, about bullying. It's not current on on the current trends, and so there isn't a lot of good quality uh, uh, information out there. And I would also say that most of the free things that are out there are from nonprofits who have a specific angle that they're pre presenting, and that doesn't mean that they're they're bad people or they're not trying to do something good. But just because you you have a passion for bullying doesn't mean that you have the experience to understand it. I give you an example. I work on criminal cases where juveniles are the perpetrator in crime, both sexual assault, uh, murder, um, and and other types of crime. And I will tell you that uh, unless you deal with the victim and the perpetrator you really don't have a complete uh, perspective on the issue of bullying. And so there are very limited people, a limited number of people in the U.S. and Canada who have the experience of working with perpetrators and victims, and really they're the only people that can properly talk about this issue. And I'll give you another example of the problem with the free information out there that's really not current. Over the last four years, according to the U.S. Justice Department, I certainly see it in, in my work, um, the fastest growing group of sex offenders in the U.S. are juvenile girls. Male sex offenders have plateaued. They haven't really gone up at all. It's female juveniles that are the greatest sex offenders and the greatest numbers and the greatest increase. Well, if you're not going to deal with sexual assault, 
by juveniles in your bullying training, and I don't see a lot of bullying training that even, even touches on sexual issues. If you don't deal with that issue, you're getting an incomplete picture. And so, and so again, yes, it is absolutely abusive, irresponsible, and certainly opens you up to liability to not have uh, training on bullying and school safety, but I would say that most of the resources that are out there are either limited, they're not current, or they're just not relevant. Lastly, I would say this and answer this question. You've got to take the information, then you've got to customize it to the specific needs of that school system. Off the shelf doesn't work. You've got to take a core curriculum, and then you've got to customize it to the needs of that specific school system. Because I will tell you that school systems uh, can be next door to each other and have different issues that need to be addressed. So, again, off the shelf doesn't work. You've got to customize it. So it's, it's, it's a complicated process of, of teaching people, of teaching professionals, and it's not a, as simple as just grabbing whatever's free from the DOE. And they have some good resources, but um, there's, uh, there, there, it really, there really are a limited amount of good, good resources out there that are going to be able to customize to a specific school system. Thank you, Dale. And this is the last question I have today, and this is from Jean. And Jean asks, I'm on a school board. What specific steps can I take to make sure the superintendent is doing what is required? Well, that's a good question. It goes back to the first, the first issue I talked about. You, you're going, as a school board, you're going to need to have a proper climate assessment and an accurate security audit performed. And you're going to have to require that everyone in executive positions and administrative positions cooperate with that assessment. And you're going to have to have it done. And if you, and if you don't, then you're guessing at it. And that's not being responsible. How much do you know? Do you know everything? Uh, where's the, where's the validation process that the administrators are bringing to you as a school board member to prove that what you, uh, what they're saying is true? Where's the facts? You know, everything has facts. Everything has data. What's the process and how accurate is that process? And then the question is, well, if you're going to do a climate assessment and you're going to do uh, some type of a security audit, well, are the people who are doing it, uh, what's their operational experience as administrators? Because really only administrators understand schools. Uh, they, they, they've administered them. They've managed them. They understand that. What's their knowledge of federal law and state law? Um, you know, that, that's the, that would be the answer I would have is uh, who's looking out for you as a school board? Are you, are you just assuming that everything is okay? Uh, we get an awful lot of calls into this office on a, on a weekly basis with school boards who are hiring us to investigate their superintendents because now they want to fire them and they want, uh, they want to find out what they, what they missed when they didn't do their due diligence when they hired the person. And now they're trying to get rid of them, and it's an ugly process, an expensive process. That's uh, that's reaction, not prevention. So, uh, last, uh, you know, again, I would say, who's looking out for you as a school board? You know, who, who's who's validating the information? So, thank you other? very much, Dale. That um, seems to wind it up. We don't have any other questions in the queue. I want to thank all of our attendees for your time. I know that uh, you have very busy days, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to view our webinar presentation. And if you have any other suggestions for webinar topics, uh, we would be we would love to receive those suggestions and we will make every attempt to see if we can uh, provide a webinar on those topics. Again, I thank you today. And uh, if you would like to reach Dale or Andy about a case or if you have a project, please give us a call here at TASA. Uh, I have placed the telephone number, the 1-800 number on our screen for your view, and or you can email Matt Hyde at tassanet.com, and we will certainly get in touch with Dale or Andy. And again, I thank you for your time, and have a wonderful afternoon.